we had uh, a local Christian radio network in upstate New York where we lived for 30 years. Let's see, I lived there 30 years, Karen 29, and the kids however old. <clears throat> I can remember exactly which stretch of road I was driving on when I first heard the song, Word of God Speak by Mercy Me. It just captured me as I realized what the song was saying. It's like my whole being joined in the prayer of that song, turned my car into a holy sanctuary. I'm finding myself at a loss for words. And the funny thing is, it's okay. The last thing I need is to be heard. But to hear what you would say. Word of God, speak. Would you pour down like rain? That's why we sang pour down the song. Washing my eyes to see your majesty. Those are words of Bart Millard. Um, he wrote them at three or four in the morning, he says. Uh, the band, it was a stretch where the band had been touring for months after uh, his huge hit, uh, I Can Only Imagine. Some of you know that song. So they were touring every day, plus trying to work on their next album. And one night, Bart says, he went to bed exhausted, feeling frustrated that everything he was saying was the same and that he had nothing else to say. And he fell asleep with that on his mind. And then about three or four, he suddenly woke up and he grabbed his journal and he wrote those words. A few weeks later, he and his producer were, his producer said, we really ought to have one more song for this album. And, and Bart grabbed his journal <clears throat> and uh, he and his producer added some more words and some music. Uh, some of the other lyrics, all that I need is to be with you and in the quiet, hear your voice. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. It spent uh, 23 weeks on the top of the charts. Uh, it won Dove Song of the Year that year. In our text, people were like Bart Millard, wanting to hear the word of God speak. Matthew chapter 13, verse 2, one day Jesus was out by the lake, the Lake of Galilee, and so many people were gathering around him, wanting to hear what he was saying, that he had to find a boat and, you know, go out a little bit, sitting in it, while the people stood along the shore. People were eagerly wanting to hear him speak. His words drew them. They sensed some power that was life-giving in them. But what were they going to do with those words that they heard? Jesus tells a parable describing what can happen when people hear the Word of God speak. A parable puts truth in story form. But not only those people gathered around Jesus, what about us? What do we do when the Word of God comes to us. Yep, there's Jesus sitting in a boat. What do we do when, <clears throat> what happens in us 
when God speaks. Pretty often, I think, a message from God does break through, does call to us. It might be from the scriptures, if we take the time to read that, or if we remember something that the scripture says. Sometimes the word comes through impressions or promptings given by the Spirit. Uh, think of our conscience, just that, that intuitive sense that we have. Sometimes the Word of God comes through brothers and sisters who also read the Scriptures, know the Scriptures, hear the Holy Spirit speaking. I think pretty often we have a sense, a feeling, that God wants us to do such and such, or to not do such and such. What happens in us when we have that, that word, when we sense that speaking within us? Jesus' parable, describing what can happen when the word of God speaks, begins, a farmer went out to sow his seed, verse 4, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Now the farmer would have liked no path through his field, but people when they're walking, and they always walked in Jesus' day, they seek the shortest way. And so this farmer had a path going through his field. And as he was sowing seed by hand, as you're sowing by hand, you get, a, you get a rhythm as you're trying to fling it evenly, and you don't stop where a path cuts across the field. And birds come, and they eat the seeds that are laying there on top of the hard-packed path. Jesus goes on, other seeds fall where the soil is just a thin layer, probably over a limestone outcropping. And the seeds that fall there, because the, the soil is shallow there, they can't put their roots down very far. And so verse 6, when the sun came up, the plants withered because they had no root. That seed lasted a little longer than the seed on the path, but not enough. Verse 7, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Uh, we don't need much explanation. We who live out in the country where we see gardens, where weeds choke out what is planted. So this seed lived even longer than what than the first two kinds but still not enough. But verse 8, still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. In other words, sometimes exceptional yields, that would be the 160, sometimes an average yield, which is the 30. Verse 10, afterwards the disciples said to Jesus, why do you speak in parables? And it's almost like there is a tone of chiding in their, in their question. You know, truth is already obscure enough. Why do you make it more obscure? I didn't have us uh, read all of Jesus' response, largely because... This sermon is already, I'm trying to crunch it as much as I can. Uh, it has some very puzzling aspects. Uh, basically, Jesus says he's speaking in parables so people won't understand. Isn't that sort of disturbing? Well, I trust if Jesus says something and does something that 
He has a very good reason for it. I trust that Jesus sees more than what we do. But here's maybe a glimmer uh, of that good reason that Jesus may be seeing. I think some of it is that Jesus spoke in parables, so those not ready to hear, and I mean hear in the sense of hear and obey, hear and understand, let it grip them. Those not ready for that would just hear a good story. And that is for their own good, that they just hear the story and not hear the truth that Jesus has hidden in the story, not hear that truth if they're not ready yet to understand and obey. Because if somebody hears the full truth without choosing to obey it, what have they just done? They have basically inoculated themselves to that truth. The next time they hear it, it'll be, yeah, I already heard and considered that. But those, those people who have truths, who have hearts that are wanting to hear and understand, when Jesus tells the parable, the story, they would, they would press in for more. And verse 12 basically says, you know, they're given more. Basically, when we act on the truth we hear, we are given more. Just a parenthesis here. I think the same reason Jesus told in parables is, is why some of the impressions of the Spirit are not as clear as we would like them to be. I don't know if you've ever been frustrated. God, why don't you just, like, I want to obey you. Why don't you make it clearer? Well, I think if we really want to obey, I think God will make sure they are strong, just strong enough that, that if we really want to hear more, we are going to be able to press in and, understand and and then do it rather than hear all these messages that we just ignore and get ourselves inoculated against an idea then uh, Jesus tells the disciples what the parable of the sower means and it's interesting you know it's about four seeds four soils so, you know, we might call it the parable, if we were naming it, the parable of the soils, maybe. Or maybe the seeds, you know, falling in the soil. But Jesus calls it the parable of the sower. He specifically, he wants us to think of God. Verse 19, the seed sown on the path is when someone hears the message of the kingdom but does not understand it. And the devil steals the word of God from their heart. Now, why wouldn't they understand it? And why would Jesus say the devil steals it? I think there's one answer that answers both of those. They don't understand it because of some lie that they are believing that blocks them from understanding, from seeing it. And it's referred to as the devil stealing it because that lie is the devil's work. Jesus describes the devil as a liar and the father of lies in John chapter 8. So sometimes God's message can't sink in because we are already committed to a lie instead. And that lie keeps the seed from even doing any germinating in us. In us. Verse 20, the seed falling on that thin layer of soil is someone who enthusiastically receives the word with joy, it says, but their roots don't go deep. 
because there's that layer of rock underneath. So when trouble or persecution comes because they are responding a little bit to the word, they quickly fall away. Their faith wilts when doing what Jesus says faces opposition. Sometimes we hear God's message and we obey out of excitement, but not out of commitment. So when our obedience gets challenged, we, we stop. We're, you know, we started to obey, but we're not really all in. We've made Jesus Lord, sort of, when someone criticizes or laughs at a, at a choice that we've made in following Jesus, then he's not really Lord after all. We need a commitment that says, I'm going to obey Jesus, even when it's looked down on, even when it's laughed at, when, when things get tough. I want my roots in Jesus to get even tougher. Verse 22, the seed falling among the weeds and the thorns. Jesus says, refer to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word so that that seed never bears the fruit of obedience in our lives. In this, in this third case, like the second, we hear the word, we welcome it, we get a start in responding to it, but unlike the second, here the roots do start to go down deep, but then other aspects of life begin to crowd out our spiritual life. We become choked by everything around us. The cares, the NIV says the worries and, and the, of life, and, and the riches and the pleasures. Sometimes the clutter of life makes us lose sight of our choice to obey. Life can have many griefs and cares, many things to worry about. And today, in our day and age especially, we've added many, many riches and pleasures. With, with the second soil, the word as it's sown in us has an obvious enemy, persecution. With this third soil, the seed of the word now has a subtle enemy and therefore a more dangerous enemy. And that is prosperity. Uh, with all the, all the good things that it be, brings that can clutter us, occupy us so much that it just makes us lose sight of our of our choice to obey. Verse 23, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. And it seems like for Matthew that understanding includes you know, you understand why it was said and so you, you, you act on it. And this soil, uh, in Jesus' uh, explanation, uh, is the most briefly described soil of all. Uh, being a fruitful Christian is not all that complicated. It just means we hear God's message and we cling to it long enough that we start to understand it and respond to it. And those two go hand in hand. You don't really understand something until you begin to respond and, and do what you are beginning to see of it. And then it begins to work and can steadily produce a harvest. Sometimes we hear God's message and act on it in faithful obedience. We are, we are good soil when we hear God saying something to us 
and we respond in obedience. We are good soil when when we who have ears to hear let ourselves hear and respond. We are we are that seed that that yields a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. And if Jesus was telling this story today to to farmers like we have here, it would be a yield of six hundred times. <laughs> so this morning and the rest of our life, the challenge is what happens in us when God speaks? What soil are we when the Word of God speaks? When a message from God breaks through and calls to us uh, through the Scriptures as we read it or remember it, uh, through impressions, promptings, given by the Spirit uh, through brothers and sisters. From time to time, I think we have a sense that, that God wants us to do such and such. What happens when that word comes and, and confronts us, challenges us, calls us to repentance, asks us to do something, what kind of soil are we? What kind of reception do we give to that seed? <clears throat>